Welcome to this series on integrations with Salesforce. My name is Paul Batterson. I am the founder and CEO of Groundwork Apps, a Salesforce ISV partner. I'm a Salesforce MVP Hall of Fame member and the author of the books, Learning Salesforce Development with Apex and Mastering Apex Programming. I also run the CloudBytes TV channel and CloudBytes Conversations podcast. I'm really excited to be bringing you this series on integrations on Salesforce for Salesforce Ben to help you plan and execute your integrations with Salesforce successfully. In this series, we're going to cover a number of the considerations, patterns, techniques, and best practices for integrating with Salesforce, starting with this session on the basics of integrating with Salesforce. The first question to begin any integration with is, do we need this integration? It might sound strange to start a video on integrations by asking, is this even needed? but it is a serious and important question. Whilst there is immense value in connecting systems and data sources together to provide a more holistic view of an organization's customers and data, integration is not always necessary and the cost may outweigh the benefits. You have to keep in mind that any system or connection that is made needs to be managed, maintained, supported, and adds additional security considerations and attack vectors. It is always important to record the why when starting such a piece of work. Why are we doing this? What are the benefits? How will we measure them? What are the costs? How will we measure those? In instances where the costs outweigh the benefits or are unclear, having such a document can help you work with the business to justify doing the work and elicit further details on expected benefits, costs, and measures that can assist in making the final decision. Importantly, this log can be used at the end of the project to help determine if the project was successful and drive out additional lessons learned. Once we determine that the integration is necessary and has sufficient value, the next step is to discuss the intended data flow. Is the integration inbound, meaning it is from external system into Salesforce, outbound, meaning it is from Salesforce to an external system, or bi-directional, where data is sent in both systems to one another? Let's look at some examples. In this first example, we have an e-commerce platform such as Shopify, where we have customer purchases being captured. Once an order has been placed, we want this order to be recreated in Salesforce as a customer. That is an account, a contact, and a related order so that we can service the customer in the future. In this direction, we are sending data from Shopify to Salesforce, so the integration is inbound. In our next example, we have Salesforce connected to an ERP system. When we close an opportunity in Salesforce, we want to create an order in the ERP system sending over the relevant customer and product details. In this integration, we are sending data from Salesforce to an external system, and so the integration is outbound. In our final example, we have Salesforce, and we are connecting to a marketing solution like MailChimp. We want to be able to send customer data to MailChimp to add individuals to mailing lists, and then in Salesforce, receive data from MailChimp on the number of sends, opens, clicks, etc. In this instance, the customer data is being sent outbound from Salesforce to MailChimp, as well as data being sent inbound from MailChimp to Salesforce, and so the integration is bi-directional. When working with bi-directional integrations, additional care should be taken, as you can end up in situations where you have a loop of updates occurring. For example, in the MailChimp scenario, you could have consent stored in Salesforce and also be utilizing MailChimp's opt-out functionality. This could lead to a situation where you have a user opt-out in MailChimp which then synchronizes to Salesforce, which then tries to opt the user out in MailChimp. This should then stop, but it is an unnecessary callout. We will discuss this further in future episodes, but it's important when starting, at, starting to plan out your integrations, you consider the full life cycle of data throughout the system. The diagrams we have seen so far, which express how our systems are integrated, have been high level system landscape diagrams. We can also draw these out as solution architecture diagrams, as we can see here. My preferred diagram style, however, to draw an integration in full detail is to create a sequence diagram utilizing universal modeling language or UML. I find this particularly useful to highlight timing information, as well as being more standardized format that other non-Salesforce architects, such as those from the systems being integrated with, are likely to be familiar with. You can find many guides to UML sequence diagrams online, but here is a simple example for a messaging integration. Here we can see the interaction between our Salesforce configuration, our messaging app from the App Exchange, and the third-party messaging API. UML sequence diagrams make the order of operations clear, as well as detailing the API endpoints being called. We can also see here that we have a bi-directional integration 
as the messaging platform is sending data back to our Salesforce app to update the records with delivery information. We could also enhance this diagram with timing metrics to debug any performance issues when testing and to highlight potential bottlenecks. Let us now look at the most common protocols we will use for our integrations and the pros and cons of each. Note here that some of these are not technically protocols, but architectural patterns. But we'll use the word protocol here in a slightly broadened term to help us in organizing our thoughts. The first and probably most ubiquitous type of API you will find today is a REST API. REST stands for Representational State Transfer and is built on top of the HTTP protocol that is used to power the internet. RESTful APIs work on the principle of a resource being based at a location which we wish to perform some action on. These actions are performed using the HTTP methods or verbs. These verbs are get, post, put, patch, and delete. Let's look at an example of using these. In Salesforce, we have the standard Salesforce REST API for our REST objects, which we can use to create and manipulate records in Salesforce. On my screen, you can see I have set up the Salesforce Postman collection linked in the notes. This allows us to test out the REST API quickly and easily. We can request that a new account record is created by posting the account's data to the services data v 63 sobjects account endpoint. You can see in our response, we get the ID of the account record that has been created. Next, we are gonna go down to our sobjects get records, and we can request using the ID that we've just created. The patch method allows us to make a partial update to the account record. Here, I am modifying the website field for our account only. If I make the update and then run the get request again, we can see here that our website has been updated. The put operation, while not supported in the REST API for S objects, replaces the entire resource at a location, blanking out values that are not provided. Finally, we can delete our record using the delete method against the record URI. We have been sending the data using JavaScript object notation or JSON format. You can also send the data in XML format as well. REST APIs are extremely common now on the web as they offer a lightweight and flexible way of sending and retrieving data when bandwidth may be limited, such as on mobile websites or on a mobile app. Because the data is sent using XML or JSON, in statically typed languages such as Apex, you will need to pass through the data and format it into the structure you need. As the format can change, there is no guarantee that all of the requested items will be available, and parsing on longer data sets can be complex. REST was developed and grew in popularity due to the fact that the dominant predecessor protocol actually contained a greater volume of data in the payload, which included metadata on how to process the payload. As the use of mobile devices with restricted bandwidth grew, the need for a reduced payload size prompted the use of REST, but in enterprise integrations, that predecessor is still extremely popular and useful. Let's meet that predecessor, SOAP. Another industry standard protocol for integration that Salesforce supports is SOAP, or Simple Object Access Protocol. SOAP shines in enterprise integration scenarios where there is a need for more rigorous standards, strong typing, and security features. If you work within a regulated industry such as finance or healthcare or the government, then SOAP is very common. A SOAP API strictly defines the types and structures of the data to be sent and received from the API. When working with a statically typed language such as Apex, this is extremely valuable as you can use the Web Services Definition Language, or WSDL, file to generate Apex classes for you, which you can then use in your integration. This lowers your overall development time significantly. In instances where you are integrating two backend systems, such as Salesforce and an ERP system, where there is no limitation on bandwidth or set time constraints for user response, SOAP can be very effective. In those instances where you are integrating with a bandwidth or time constrained solution, then SOAP may not be the most applicable integration option. Again, we can test SOAP using Postman as shown on the screen here. You can see that I have imported the Enterprise WSDL API to Postman, and it will create a number of methods for us to use and check. I can log in here, and I can go down, and I can also run the Describe S object to get my Describe information about my account, which I have specified here. We can see that the information is far more detailed in scope. Both the REST and SOAP protocols that we have reviewed so far rely upon one system polling the other for updates. If we had a use case where we wanted to get all of our new account records, having our system make the request on a regular schedule is inefficient, particularly if we have spikes of activity. 
This is where event-based integrations can help. Salesforce offers multiple integration options through the PubSub API, including platform events and change data capture. The Salesforce PubSub API is built on the gRPC protocol that is a high-performance integration solution built on top of HTTP2. Change Data Capture allows you to subscribe to changes within your Salesforce data from an external system to keep the data up to date incrementally in near real time instead of doing large periodic synchronizations. Platform events are well-structured, small events that you can subscribe to, which are either standard, that is defined and published by Salesforce, or custom, where they're defined and published by you. If you are working with a distributed solution where multiple subscribers may want the same information when an event occurs, then the PubSub API and gRPC are a good choice. It should be noted that you can use the streaming API for these use cases as well. However, it is now recommended that you look at using gRPC and the PubSub API instead. There is now another newer option that is fast becoming an industry standard, which helps developers to work with complex data sets in a simpler manner. That is GraphQL. GraphQL is a newer protocol that allows developers to work with complex record data in a more natural way by traversing a graph of the data structure instead of making many disparate requests. Three primary benefits of GraphQL are, number one, developers must specify which fields and resources they wish to have returned in the response, which will minimize the size of the payload. Number two, resources can be traversed and aggregated across the graph so that the developer can retrieve multiple related records in a single request, saving round trips to the server. And number three, developers can request information about the resource they are retrieving, its fields and data types, to build more dynamic applications. If you are working on a more responsive application integration, particularly in JavaScript, GraphQL can help make these integrations simpler and easier. GraphQL also has an adapter for Lightning Web Components, which you can use to help improve Lightning Web Component performance. We have an example GraphQL query in a Lightning Web Component here that we can see on screen. It retrieves five accounts and five contacts at the same time. This code is one of the examples provided by Salesforce in the LWC Recipes repository linked below. And we can see the output of it on our screen here in this Lightning Web Component for our developer org. The final section of this basics review is to discuss tooling. All the protocols and items we have covered so far are the bare metal pieces of information that allow you to build your own integrations with Salesforce. We're now going to discuss the different tools we can, uh, we can use and different tools that are available to us to build out these integrations and when they should be utilized. These are presented in alphabetical order. As the platform's native language, Apex allows developers to make callouts to external services and systems, as well as define custom REST and SOAP API endpoints in Apex for external systems and developers to utilize. Apex can also listen for platform and change data capture events, it cannot utilize GraphQL natively, although Apex library implementations do exist. Apex should be utilized when there is no other integration means or a highly custom integration is needed. If a SOAP API is available, you should utilize the provided WSDL to generate the Apex classes for you, or if working with REST, see if the API has an open API specification you can utilize, although from experience, the produce code can be a somewhat more verbose than you might want to produce yourself. For most popular solutions and many use cases where an integration is required, you can find a solution on the Salesforce App Exchange that will meet your needs. Apps that are listed on the App Exchange have undergone a review and assessment by Salesforce and should be supported by the vendor. A small note of caution is to check when the app was last updated and ensure the apps are still being maintained so they follow the latest best practices and support the newest features of the external system and platform. DataLoader provides a way for developers to manipulate large amounts of data into and out of Salesforce using a command line interface. This is particularly helpful if working with a legacy system that needs to send data to Salesforce on a scheduled fashion but cannot itself connect through APIs. A common example is a legacy database that can export data as a CSV file. DataLoader can then be programmed to take this data and use the Salesforce APIs to make the necessary changes in Salesforce. External objects allow you to display data from external systems in Salesforce without the data being stored in Salesforce. If the system you are integrating with supports the OData specification, then you may be able to utilize this feature. It is a paid add-on, but it is extremely useful for instances where you want to enable users to see external records, 
but do not want or need those records within Salesforce. If you are working with an API that supports the OpenAPI 2 or 3 specifications, then you can create an external service in Salesforce that can be called from Flow as an invocable action. This can be a very good way of integrating with a solution if you have a compliant API and do not have the technical skill to code or manage an Apex-based integration. Heroku AppLink, newly released as GA at the time of recording, allows you to make calls to the Salesforce database from Heroku or expose Heroku APIs in Salesforce easily to Apex and Flow to utilize. This is a new feature, but it is very powerful for you extending Salesforce application capabilities or integrating apps hosted on Heroku into Salesforce. Heroku Connect allows data to be synchronized bi-directionally from a Postgres database hosted on Heroku into Salesforce. This is a very useful solution when you want to provide a high-performance customer-facing web app or API that works with Salesforce data. Integration platforms, often referred to integration platforms as a service or IPaaS, such as MuleSoft and Boomi, enterprise service buses, ETL providers, and other integration platforms and tools, connect to Salesforce using the APIs we have mentioned. If your organization has one of these tools, you should consider utilizing it as a way of improving delivery speed, as well as connecting Salesforce to your broader enterprise systems landscape, as we will discuss in the next video. In this session, we have covered off the basic principles, protocols, and methods of integrating Salesforce with other systems. In the next episode, Architecting Salesforce Integrations, we will look at how you should architect your integration, the key architectural decisions, security and authentication, as well as the discussion of different patterns of integration.